أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة من العالمين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وأنيس نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتع علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا أرحم الراحمين in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, the gracious, the almighty, all praises be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of mankind and the master of the day of judgment, my respected brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is said in one tradition that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, after one of the battles and where the Muslims were victorious in. He gathered his army, he gathered his companions, and he addressed them by this speech. He said, blessed are those who have performed the minor jihad and have yet to perform the greater jihad. Now imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, after hours of battling, the people, they're tired, they're exhausted. Some of them were wounded. Some of them, their loved ones were killed. They left their homes, their families, their children, their lands. And in the end, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells them that all of this is pretty much nothing. It's minor. They were surprised. They were shocked by the speech of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. They ask him, Ya Rasulullah, what is this great jihad you are talking about? What is this mighty jihad? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa he replies that the greater jihad or Al Jihad Al Akbar is the battle against the self, the struggle against the nafis. In other words, in Arabic, jihad and nafis. That is the greater Jihad. Amir al Mu'minin, salamullahi alayhi, in one narration, he says, Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbah. One who knows himself knows his Lord, knows his Creator, knows his Master. The topic of understanding oneself is probably one of the most difficult matters in the religion of Islam. And perhaps it's not over-exaggerating to say that one of the most complex issues in the schools of philosophy and in the school of ethics is understanding the nafis and what the nafis is made out of. What is the reality of this nafis, of the soul of the human being? This topic is not an easy one that can be spoken about in a discussion or two or even ten. This discussion, this matter needs a constant reminder. This discussion can be spoken about in depth from different perspectives. And it is something that has a great effect on our progress when it comes to our spiritual connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why it is of great importance and of great value. Allah Azza wa Jal, we see in the Holy Quran, He speaks about the nafis in a number of verses. One time, He categorizes this nafis into three different categories. An nafs al amara bisu, an nafs al mutma'inna. And Allah Azza wa Jal, as well, in many different verses, He speaks about some of the spiritual diseases that can strike the snafis. And how does one deal with it? How sometimes a person can feel pain 
because he is following this certain type of nafis, for example. He is a prisoner of that type of nafis. As well, if we go to the traditions and to the books of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, over hundreds of ahadith which speak about the nafis and describe the nafis. And when you go to the books of akhlaq, of ethics, you see that the majority of what is spoken about, if not all, to be kind, I'll say eight, around 80%, can all go back and can all revolve around understanding the self, understanding the soul. What is its reality? You want to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to know your reality as a human being. You need to know your nafs. You need to know this soul of yours. Because as the Imam says, the one who knows his nafis is able to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And this is, by the way, not only in Islam, this is spoken about in many different religions and many different faiths, even from different aspects, it can also uh, looked upon, whether it's academically, whether it's uh, physically, spiritually, a lot of the times, if you're, let's say, an athlete, your coach, he tells you to, you know, tell me more about yourself. Tell me more what position you like to play. Tell me more about your weakness, your strengths. I can put you in the right place. So you, you need to understand yourself as an athlete, where you best fit into, so you can succeed in that position you play in. For example, spiritually, academically, the same thing. Your professor or your teacher, they ask you, well, where's your weakness? Where's your strengths? We can improve that. We can work on that. What's, what's something you're good at? So you can follow that field and you can blossom in that area because you are good at it. You need to understand who you are. Who, what's this nafis of yours capable of reaching? Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi, he says... That this nafis is the first battlefield that the person faces in this life. The first area in where uh, one is battling, is in constant war, is this nafis of his. He's in constant battle with what? With the shaitan, with iblis, with his with his thoughts, desires, feelings, emotions, which are all part of the nafis. Now, imagine how important this nafis is that Allah Azza wa Jal, the Almighty, in the Quran, He swears by this nafis. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears of something, it's of great importance and value. That's why if we go to Surah Al Shams, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa nafsin wa ma sawaha. And by the soul and the one who fashioned it, the one who created it. And who is the one, by the way, who created it and who brought it into this realm of existence? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now a question, why does Allah in the verse say wa nafsin wa ma sawaha? He says the nafis first and then by the one who fashioned it or created it. Well, there's a reason behind this and perhaps one of the reasons that the nafis is mentioned before Allah himself in this specific verse is that the nafis is a door, is a pathway, is a road that can lead you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As simple as that. The Quran continues on in the verses after this. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Then with the knowledge of right and wrong, Allah inspired this nafis. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Victorious, blessed is the one who purifies this nafis. In another verse, in the continuation, Allah says, وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And doomed is the one who corrupts it. So this nafis 
can either elevate us to the highest levels of spirituality and taqwa and can lead us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the highest levels of perfection or this nafis can ruin us, completely deviate us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachings of the Almighty. Now the human being, if he or she want to reach Allah azza wa jal, there are many different ways to do so. One of these ways, for example, is by having the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam, following Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. But what's interesting, if you follow Muhammad wa al Muhammad and you go back to their teachings and to their words of advice, you see that they tell us, O oh servant, do you want to be a true abid for Allah Azza wa Jal? Do you want to really and truly understand who you are as a human being? Do you really and truly want to elevate yourselves to the highest levels of worship? Then what do you need to know? You need to know your nafis. Again, you see an uh, importance to the nafis. Everything goes back to understanding this nafis of ours. So knowing this nafis is a pathway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a pathway to the Ahlul Bayt, is a pathway to spirituality, is a pathway to becoming a loyal servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a pathway to fulfilling your full potential. Inshallah, in these previous weeks, we will start a series in where we will talk about some of the spiritual and ethical aspects from the religion of Islam. And the goal of this series is to wake us from our slumber and to revive this heart of ours and to improve our spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God willing. Now, a lot of times we are in need of a reminder, of advice, of a lesson in order to understand the reality of ourself in order to understand our positioning in this life in order to reevaluate where we are what we have accomplished and what do we still lack in our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and perhaps these discussions can be a reminder for each and every one of us to remind ourselves that this dunya is nothing but a pathway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all what matters in the end is nothing other than our a'mal, other than our actions, other than our salat and our siyam and our obligations in which we perform on a daily basis. So this series, inshallah, is to remind all of us and how we can improve spiritually. And as the Quran says in many verses, one of them and where Allah says, And continue to remind, for that reminder will certainly benefit the believers. Now moving forward, this series will focus on ethical lessons from the book of Jami'u al-Sa'adat or the collector of felicities as translated in English. This book which is written by a shaykh al-Naraqi, may Allah bless his soul. Now before we begin to study this book and to give some of the uh, lessons in which Al-Allam al-Naraqi speaks about and how uh, to deal with it, it is important to understand the background behind this book. Who is the author of this book? Al-Shaykh Muhammad Mahdi ibn Abi Dhar al-Naraqi who was born in the city of Naraq, Kashan in Iran in the year of 1128. Al Hijri. And it was said that from his early years of his childhood, 
He was a very bright and genius student. He was one of a kind. And what's very interesting, given the influx of the Western preachers and missionary at the Middle East, during his time, Alam al-Narati was able to gain some knowledge in modules and in uh, courses that were not very re related to Islam or perhaps were not even taught in the Islamic seminary. He was able to learn uh, a number of languages. One of them was Latin and another was Hebrew. So he was able to learn these languages and by learning them, he wanted to defend the religion of Islam and see what arguments they present against the religion of Islam. And as well, his uh, traditional classical uh, Hausa studies, which is the fuqh, the jurisprudence, usul al-fuqh, the fundamentals of jurisprudence, history, uh, akhlaq, uh, f philosophy, and so on and so forth. Now, Al-Allama al-Naraqi, or Shaykh al-Naraqi, he migrated to Iraq, to Karbala, to focus on his studies. And he moved to the city of Karbala, which was the center, which was the hub of the Shia uh, Islamic uh, nation back then. And the one running the Hawza at his time was the scholar by the name of Sheikh Yusuf al-Bahrani, may Allah bless his soul. Although Sheikh Yusuf al-Bahrani was a very prominent uh, scholar, it is said that al Sheikh al-Naraqi was very intrigued and captivated by another teacher who was a small town scholar who recently moved to Karbala as well by the name of al-Wahid al-Bahbahani, who was a very well-known scholar in our history and he studied under a Sheikh al-Wahid al-Bahbahani for around eight years. Now after his return to uh, Kashan, to his uh, city, and despite his prominence as a religious authority, he lived a very simple life that oftentimes he would not have a meal for days. And under his leadership, when he went back to his city, he was able to uh, teach and bring up many uh, great scholars. One of them was his very own son, Ahmad al-Naraqi, who was a very well-known scholar in our Shia history. And in addition to this, he penned hundreds, hundreds of books in different fields, in theology, in history, in mysticism, in philosophy, and the famous of these books is the book we are about to speak about, Jami'u al-Sa'adat, The Collector of Felicities, which is uh, a three-volume book. Now, this book is translated into English, or I wouldn't really say translated, it's more summarized into English. You might find it online. However, not all of it. You'll find uh, they summarized parts of the book. So you can have a general overview of what uh, Sheikh al naraqi is speaking about. However, I advise for those brothers and sisters who understand Arabic and who are fluent to take a look at this book as it is very important. It is one of the most important akhlaq books we have in our traditions. And it is taught in many different Islamic institutions. And especially in the seminaries, in the Hausa, there isn't a, a sheikh, there isn't a seeker of knowledge who has not studied this book or read some of this book during his uh, lifetime. Now, in his book, Sheikh al-Naraqi, he states that self-respect is one of the f f most important human values. And I'm going to read this quote by quote. He says, it is better if the poor hides his poverty from others as much as possible and builds the spirits of austerity and self-respect in him than to ask people for help. He must not honor the wealthy for the sake of their wealth, which will lead to belittling himself. Instead, he or she should feel greater than them and thus keep his or her self-respect. So the poor should be indifferent to their wealth and should not expect anything from
from them. And this is one of the reasons in where al-Shaykh al-Naraqi, despite, uh, as we mentioned, that some nights he would go without eating, it was because he had this self-respect. He never used to go around and ask people and beg his teachers for money and for help. No, he says that self-respect is a human value, is a very important human value that one should embody. Now, some of the moral characteristics of Shaykh al-Naraqi, and this is very interesting, because a person who's speaking about akhlaq and who's giving us lessons about uh, ethics and etiquette, at least he needs to reach a certain level where he is able to write about this and preach about this and to apply this. So it's very interesting that the first two volumes of the book Sheikh al-Naraqi, he released them to the public and he gave lectures about One time, this person comes to his uh, house and he sees that he has uh, a third volume which he still hasn't talked about or lectured about. And he asks him, Sheikh, now, you know, we've really benefited from your lessons and uh, what you uh, presented to us. Why do you still have this here? Give it to the public, teach it to us, print it. Release it to the people. Allama al-Naraqi, he tells him, I still have not applied all of the teachings in this book. And until I apply each and every single words of advice and narration in which I bring in this book, I will not release this book. Number one is to act. It's not about just giving advice and talking and I haven't practiced it. I need to practice it myself. And when I practice it myself and when I feel worthy, then I will release this book to the general public. This was the attitude as Shaykh al-Naraqi had, which perhaps because of it made him reach this great level and made his book be of great importance. Now, one of his other very outstanding characteristics was his endurance and his patience in the times of struggle and in his times of poverty. And an example of his endurance, brothers and sisters, is because of his poverty, as we mentioned, he was not able to buy a candle or even oil for the lamp to study at night. So when nighttime comes, he couldn't study, he couldn't read, he couldn't write. What he would do is he would go to a public restroom when nighttime comes and he would study in the restroom for hours and hours until midnight. And when midnight would come, he would then go to the mosque and uh, pray and supplicate and perform Salat al-Layl. And I remember in Hawza, Pretty much every single teacher that used to come to our classroom would always speak about this specific story of Shaykh al-Naraqi. And it is to motivate us and to give us this uh, confidence in our self that we can achieve whatever we want. That we're able to accomplish our dreams. That it's all about the mentality. It's all about how you're strong mentally and if you're strong mentally no, what, no matter what the circumstances are and no matter what the situation is and no matter the struggles and tribulations that you are facing in life you are still able to succeed and you know back at home it's not like here there's a lot of problems uh, people have to worry about electricity and water food and so on and so forth alhamdulillah here we have it it's blessed we have everything. I'm not saying there's not other problems in life. However, these basic necessities are here. One does not have to worry about them. So if one wants to achieve his or her goals, they are able to do so. And it is possible. And just like you read in the autobiographies of many famous people, whether it's athletes, whether it's CEOs, whether it's business owners, that they tell you, you know, we started from nothing. We had nothing. We were poor. I only had $10 in my wallet. I was able to do so and so. And I was able to work myself up until I reached what I have reached. And this was the story of Alama and Naraqi. And this was a very uh, outstanding characteristic in which he embodied. Another characteristic that al-Shaykh al-Naraqi uh, embodied 
was his uh, delicate poetic spirit that he was able to uh, translate this spiritual feelings, if you want to say, of his uh, into pen and paper. So he would write these uh, feelings of his, these uh, emotions, into lines of poetry, into uh, mystic poetry of akhlaq and arfan, and you can find it in some of his uh, books as well. Now, after long years of giving for the religion of Islam, he, he passes uh, away, and it is said that the city of Naraq in Kashan was very saddened by the news of his passing, and he was then his body was transferred to uh, Al Najaf, where he was buried next to Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. For the souls of all our respected maraji and ulama, all of our dead ones, let us recite for them a surat al Mubarakat al Fatiha, but before it, a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran He says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal insa illa liya'budun And I did not create mankind and jinn except to worship me That the purpose behind our creations is the worship Is the ibadah of Allah azza wa jal However, a couple of questions arise here that this ibadah, this so-called worship, is it a purpose for the creation for us human beings or for the creator, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And why would Allah azza wa jal create us simply to worship him? We know, brothers and sisters, and I think we've mentioned this many times, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ainul Kamal, as they say in philosophy, meaning his essence is the ultimate manifestation of perfection. And what I mean by that is that there isn't a single time in life, a single moment in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not the, the all-knowing, the all-knowledgeable, the almighty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, is, and will always be the all-knowing. That is why they say in the books of theology, Sifatuhu Ainu Dhatih. What does that mean? That his traits are part of his essence. And the one who is perfect is not in need for anything else or for anyone else. He is simply perfection. Al Kamal, Al Mutlaq. So because he is perfection, he is referred to as Ainul Kamal. Now there's a saying they mention in philosophy which state that the perfect creation's purpose is itself. And the creation which is imperfect, its purpose behind its creation is completing itself. And to give a practical example of this to what they mean is that you have two types of people. You have an individual who is kind and you have another individual who lacks this uh, trait of kindness and generosity. Now, the one who lacks this trait of generosity, he needs to get out of his heart, out of his nafis, this greed and this selfishness and this stinginess, in other words. And when he's able to take it out, then he is able to perfect himself when it comes to this specific trait, when it comes to karam, when it comes to generosity. And to do so, one can uh, perform a number of things. Well, he, can, he or she can donate to the poor. They can give to the poor. They can help uh, the, the, the needy as well. It, it doesn't always need to be materialistically. Well, you can give part of your... Uh, you can give some of your time some of the area of expertise you have and help others with now when you are able to sacrifice and when you are able to give then you are perfecting yourself when it comes 
to this trait. And when we remember when we spoke about perfection, we said that perfection needs to be in every aspect. So every trait, every single aspect in life, one needs to aim or his goal must be to reach perfection in it. Perfecting every single thing one does. So this is on one side. On another side, you have the person who is kind, who's born in an environment, who was raised up uh, in a family that was uh, very generous and always giving. For example, if you go back in history, you read about a man by the name of Hatim al-Ta'i. Hatim al-Ta'i, if you look back at the words uh, of what the historians speak about, he was at the time of jahili, at the time of ignorance. He was very well known for his karam. And they would use him as an example when it came to generosity. They want to say Fulan is Karim or Fulan embodies the strait of Karam. They compare him to Hatim al Ta'i. That's how uh, well he was known for his Karam and giving to people and helping the poor. So, this uh, trait that Hatim had, his son and his daughter were able to get influenced by it and we're able to inherit it and most of the times that's the case I'm not saying all the times that if our parents or we're brought in the right environment that we're going to be of that environment but it's going to have a massive role and massive effect on us and it might make it much easier for us to embody that certain traits so that person to perfect themselves they do not need to give and they do not need to do so and so now when that person gives to the poor when that person helps that individual cross the street let's say and gives them money to buy clothes and food they are doing so because it is part of them it's because they are raised to be like that so they're not technically perfecting themselves because they are already perfect in that trait because they know they don't they're not doing it to perfect themselves they already reached the level of perfection when it comes to the trait. so if one trains themselves, if they lack this certain trait and characteristics, then they are able to perfect in this uh, specific uh, trait and are able to elevate themselves when it comes uh, to this characteristic. So this sacrifice, this giving, this generosity, it can be done sometimes without any effort if you're raised with this. If, it's, if it becomes part of you, if you perfect it. And on another hand, you need to try hard. You need to kind of force yourself so you can perfect this trait, which is needed to elevate yourself in spiritual connection with the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From that, we see that some individuals have this naqus, this deficiency in them. And as human beings, a lot of us have this def deficiency in us. We're not infallible. We're not masumin. We lack many things, we need to improve, we sin, we have our flaws. And if one does not improve himself or herself, work on this nafis, which the Imam Salamullah said, Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbah, then one will stay in these flaws and will stay sinning and will create a veil between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when this veil is on the nafis, then one is not able to spiritually elevate themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ghani, is the rich. We have naqis, we have deficiency, we are the poor. And Allah azza wa jal describes himself in the holy book when he says, Ya ayyuhan nas, antum al fuqara O oh, people, you are the one that are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You rely on Allah azza wa jal. Your existence relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are dependent on Allah azza wa jal. Wallah huwa al ghani. He is the rich. He is the all dependent. He is the power. He is perfection. With that being said, if Allah Azza wa Jal is perfection, then what is the purpose behind this ibadah? Is it for the creation or is it for the creator, for Allah Himself? And the answer to that is this worship, this ibadah, 
is a purpose for the creation, for us human beings. And through that worship, we need to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through that worship, we can reach the highest of levels of spirituality through this ibadah. But ibadah in its correct sense, when our hearts are connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when everything we are doing in terms of worship is strictly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is for satisfying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything we perform in life on a daily basis, whether it's going to work, whether it's taking care of our families, whether it's staying these long hours in our shift, they can be a form of worship. They can be a form of ibadah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for them as well. As long as your intention is to satisfy Allah azza wa jal. Is the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same as school. Same as with studying. Same with anything you do in life. You need to make it a form of satisfaction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if it is a form of satisfaction then you are able again to elevate yourself to high levels of iman so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the purpose behind this worship for us to grow for us to reach him how to reach him with this nafis when we want to satisfy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the actions that this nafis performs Again, it all revolves around the nafis. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And if one is not fully aware of this, and if one does not keep this in the back of their head, that everything would do is for the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then a person can live in the state of ghafla. And the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt as well as the Quran speaks about ghafla. And ghafla is the state of unawareness of the mind. And this unawareness of the mind can have an effect on the actions we perform on a daily basis. Not only the actions, as well as our worship, as well as our ibadah. We might pray, stand on the prayer mat. And say Allahu Akbar, start with Surah Al-Fatiha and read another Surah. However, our mind is not there. Our mind is absent. Why? Because we live in the state of ghafla. That we do not understand the reason behind this prayer. We do not understand the words that we are uttering out of our mouths. Even though if our intention is to satisfy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but our actions stay otherwise. Here is where the... A knowledge of akhlaq and ethics comes into perspective. That's why Allama al Naraqi he wrote this book in order to let this ibadah of ours transcend on a daily basis in our life, in our lifestyle, in the way we act, in the way we talk, in the way we eat, in the way we treat others, in the way we treat our, ma- our uh, brothers and sisters. And so on and so forth. He begins the book by speaking about akhlaq and by defining what is akhlaq. And akhlaq is simply a lifestyle that one needs to follow in order to grow spiritually with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And it's not only the do's and don'ts. The do's and don'ts are in fuqh, are in the sharia Allah. Yajuz, la yajuz, haram, halal, mubah, mustahab, makruh. These five ahkam, this is what the sharia Allah teaches us. Akhlaq on the other hand, or ilmul akhlaq, the knowledge of ethics and etiquette, is to guide us and to give us a pathway in order to have a certain lifestyle which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, which the Ahlul Bayt recommend. And when we follow this lifestyle, we are able to work on this nafis of ours because this lifestyle all revolves back to the nafis. And I'm going to end off by this so we can start the next discussion without giving much introduction. Al-Allama al-Naraqi, he begins by speaking about uh, this nafis of ours, understanding the soul and the powers of the soul. And as we said, 
that everything we do should be for the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us in this uh, world and He brought us into this realm of existence and He made uh, worship uh, the goal, not the main goal, well, the link or the means in order to reach a high spiritual connection with the Almighty. Tayyib. How did He help us in growing? How did he uh, give us the proper means for us to elevate ourselves? It's important to understand who we are as human beings. And in order to do so, we need to go back in history and see who the first creation was. It was Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him, Iblis, he was jealous of the creation of Adam. And he did not prostrate down to Adam even though Allah Azza wa Jal ordered him to do so. He thought that he was of higher status than Adam. I am made from fire. What is this? He's made from clay. What is this creature that you created, Ya Allah? And he did not prostrate to Adam even though Allah ordered him. And he tried to negotiate with Allah Azza wa Jal to make some deal with the Almighty that, Ya Allah, if you let this one pass by, then I will perform a worship for you unlike any other. My ibadah will be on a complete different level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells him, and this is a lesson for us, dear brothers and sisters, that when we want to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, we worship Him the way He wants, not the way we want. A lot of us, we try to, uh, you know, give our opinions when it comes to this ahkam. Well, do I have to do this? Does, uh, do I have to pray five salah? It's okay, I can skip one, make them four. Salah subah is not important. I can do this and this. I can take away this hukum. I can just close my eye, not focus on it. Well, it doesn't work that way. If you want to reach perfection, you need to follow the sharia Allah the way it is. You have to have... Taslim, submission, and their Islam, its root word is taslim, submission, submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what it means to be a Muslim, to be a mu'min, to be a believer in Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, nonetheless, Allah Azza wa Jal, with the, in the conversation he has with the angels, because even some of the angels, other than Iblis, did not, pros, did not want to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam, and they start to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is this uh, creation you created that will bring corruption to the land and that will shed blood? As the verses in the Quran say, I don't want to take too long on this point. However, Allah Azza wa Jal, because of His wisdom, because of His hikmah, and we've spoken about this trait many times, that Allah Azza wa Jal is hakim, Allah is wise. So anything He does, it is for a reason. And because as human beings we are weak, we are given certain abilities. We are not able to fully understand the reasoning behind some of these ahkam. What is going on in the metaphysical world? He had an answer to that. He gave Adam alayhi salam the knowledge as the verses in the Quran say, Adam al -asma kullaha. He taught Adam the names. And he asked the angels, are you able to tell me what these names are? And they weren't able to do so. That's one. They said, Ya Allah, we only know what you know. And they prostrated to Adam alayhi salam. And they knew that Adam was a superior creation than them. That's why, brothers and sisters, the human being is, as some of the narrations mention, is able to reach a certain level which is higher than the malaika. And as well, if he's not taking care of this nafis in the correct way, he can reach a certain level which is lower than the animals. And how does this happen? What are the spiritual diseases which can lead to that? Al-Allama al naraqi he mentions them one by one in this book. Inshallah, we will try to speak about some of the most practical and important ones in the upcoming discussions. And we will begin by speaking about the nafis, the power of the nafis, 
and what are the tools and the abilities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us as human beings to be the best of his creations insha'Allah walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibin al-tahirin